Great. Well, thank you very much, um, everybody, for joining this session this afternoon. Um, appreciate you taking the time out of uh, what's been a very busy few weeks, I'm sure. Do you really appreciate it? Um, so my name is Hannah Jackson. Um, I am the head of NSN's um, applicant services on the free school side. Um, and really do appreciate uh, you all taking the time and the time of our speakers today, Anne Casey and Steve Hodsman. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Anne Casey, who will be chairing this session this afternoon, just to um, let you know how the process will work today. Thank you. Lovely. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really nice to, to see some very familiar names joining us. And we're in for an incredibly interesting and informative session this afternoon. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Anne Casey. I'm an advisor for New Schools Network and work on the Academy Ambassadors Programme and for the DFE as an external expert. I'll be chairing the session and uh, looking at your questions, looking at key themes and making sure that we answer as many of those questions as possible. I'll go into the, the mechanics of the session in a minute, but more importantly, I would like to introduce our uh, key speaker this afternoon, uh, Steve Hodsman uh, is a risk expert. We couldn't have a better person this afternoon. Steve had a career in the Police Special Operations Unit and was involved in major incident response. So ideally placed to bring his wealth of experience uh, to uh, the trust that he is chair of at the moment. He's been involved in school governance since 2010, uh, chaired a federated secondary and primary govern governing body and then was appointed to the Board of Directors in 2014. And he's led major changes in, in the Trust, in Delta Academy's Trust, and has restructured the Board of Directors and members. Steve's also a national leader of governance and has been made, working with, with trusts around the country and at the moment, as you will find out later, impacting positively during these challenging months on many, many um, other schools and trusts in, in the UK. Uh, so Steve will be taking us through the session this afternoon. I know that with the numbers and the interest is very high, there will be lots of questions coming, coming out. So what I would like people to do is to um, turn off their video and their audio so we don't get any feedback during the session. On your screen, there is a chat button. So please type in your questions as we go through the session this afternoon. I will be collating those and, and, and have planned some points along the session where we will stop and answer your questions. If we run out of time, uh, we will make sure that all of those answers are, all of those questions are answered and put into a document and distributed with the slides following the session. So I think I will pass over and welcome Steve. Lovely to have you here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your approach to crisis management within the education sector. Thanks very much indeed. Can I just make sure that everybody can see that? Yes. Ah, that's lovely, that's great. Um, well, thank you very much to Hannah and the team at NSN for bringing us all together. It's, it's um, really important and one of the things I've, I've benefited, benefited from um, over the last 10 or so years in government is, is sharing practice with other chairs and with other board members. And I find it so important that, that um, we can share uh, each other's experiences and it helps us um, and benefits us greatly to uh, look at how other people do it. I'm not suggesting at all that, that our practice is better than anybody else's, um, but it's at, um, we, we have um, a trust that is probably uh, a little bit, a bit bigger than most and so we've been able to put some things into place that um, uh, are, are perhaps unusual in the education sector. From my perspective I bring sort of a, a, a career of crisis management and what I've tried to do within the COVID-19 situation is to bring that experience uh, into within the education sector. Um, for some reason, this isn't going for on. Yes, there we are. Um, so what I want to, to have a look at this afternoon, if, uh, um, if we can, is what do we mean by a crisis? What are the exam We've got some examples of crisis management response and crisis management planning. 
and then just take a quick look through the phases of crisis management and then perhaps the the most important part of um, the presentation this afternoon is the role of non-executive leaders in responding to a crisis and then the actual response to the crisis that we at Delta have put in place over over um, uh, the last few weeks and then where are we now and what, what do we need to do moving forward? He says, and it's not moving forward. Apologies for this. Um, so what do we mean by a crisis? Well, a crisis is defined as a significant threat to operations that can have negative consequences if not handled properly. And in crisis management, the threats, the potential damage a crisis can inflict on an organisation, its stakeholders, and uh, if it's industrial, the industry itself. Um, I've got a, an example of an, an industrial um, incident that happened uh, whilst I was in the police. And, and hopefully um, I'll be able to share with you some of the learning that we got from that, not just, uh, uh, not just from an emergency service response, but the future as well about what, what happened as a consequence of, of, of that incident. And then also I want to just have a quick look here at um, an emergency, so the difference between a crisis and an emergency. An emergency is defined as a dangerous or serious situation such as an accident that happens suddenly or unexpectedly and needs some immediate action. And this is just a little comparative table that I found from difference between .com about the differences between a crisis and an emergency. And as you can see there, they define the crisis slightly differently as a crisis is a decisive, difficult or unstable situation that involves an impending change. And then on the other side, the emergency is about the uh, emergency situation that poses a serious and immediate risk to health, life and property. The implications of the two are not dissimilar in some ways. Um, the crisis uh, implication is that there's a negative change. So it could be even something as uh, straightforward as perhaps the reputation, particularly in the MAP sector, where currently the reputation uh, of the, the, the MAP sector in the wider education system is called into question, usually by some um, issue of um, accountability or not being held to account properly at the governance levels. And in the emergency situation, that would be more in, in, in previous, uh, my previous world around such things as road accidents or flooding or whatever it might be. Um, but actually the major difference is the negative changes that could, could be impacted uh, on either a, a company or an individual. And, and whereas with natural disasters, people seem to be a little bit more accepting of those sorts of things uh, uh, moving forward. So the example that I want to give is something uh, that I was involved in um, going back on the 16th of April 2001. The Canoco oil refinery in and around the River Humber um, uh, is one of three or four major refineries uh, making all of the dif different diesels and petrols that we all use on a day-to-day -day basis. And on the 16th of April 2001, not that I remember it very well, other than that it was um, Easter Monday afternoon and I was at home in the garden when I got called out to attend to it, so it sticks in my mouth a little bit. But basically what happened was was huge explosion uh, at the site. One man died and debris was found 11 kilometres from, from the site of the uh, explosion. The initial emergency response was the usual thing you, you, you tend to get at these sorts of things with the police, the fire, the ambulance and everybody um, uh, attending the scene itself. But then there was the post in emergency response as well, which went on for a number of days because it blew out half of the, the windows in the nearby village. And therefore we had to make sure that, that everybody was looked after in the longer term. The outcome of that was that there was quite a big change in working practices for both the refinery and the emergency responders. And it's something that uh, over the last 20 years or so has had a real impact on the way in which crisis management itself is looked at. The change in culture um, that came across the petrochemical industry was huge. 
and it uh, it became more of um, uh, a looking forward and starting to um, uh, become more of a proactive safety industry than it historically was and it became a uh, it used to be a reacting to everything and now they're very much proactive about things to the extent that i saw on linkedin yesterday um, strangely enough uh, uh, um, uh, one of their uh, pieces from Kanoko, and they've now gone 600 continuous days without any issues of safety or any accidents on the site whatsoever um, also the consequences of this and lots of other sort of major disasters that happened in and around the 1990s 2000s was that there was an introduction uh, of quite a, a stringent legislative process uh, about the response and that made new demands um, on community safety both from the police the fire the ambulance and also from the, from the company themselves and it brought in about an in-depth planning process for the response to major emergencies and that's where really crisis management in uh, the original form came from and it meant that there became greater collaboration between the industry and civil authorities so crisis crisis and emergency planning one of the things that we sort of used to live by was whose responsibility is it well basically it's the responsibility of everybody uh, whether it be the company, whether it's the emergency services, whether it's schools, whether it's local authorities or whatever it might be, industry across the piece and lots and lots of private industries now and, and many of you are from uh, industry and um, you will have responsibilities in your own companies around crisis management and making sure that IT systems etc are all backed up in the background so that we don't lose uh, the information that we all have. Um, the purpose of it is to, to make sure that we've got a pre-planned response to any crisis or emergency so that we're not actually thinking on the hoof and that we have some form of reference material or, or procedure or plan and that people are, are trained in how to respond to a crisis or an emergency. The content of emergency plans or crisis management plans are obviously based on risk. And first of all, pe people and companies do risk assessments and they come up with various scenarios about what um, uh, issues may be faced in the event of some form of crisis or an emergency. It goes on then to have a look at the response of how are you going to respond to that. And it's, if it's IT, it may be having a, a site in the background or if it's, you know, if the, these days there seems to be a lot of hacking going on so how are you going to respond to that within a school for example how are you going to close a school how are you going to inform the local authority how are you going to tell the parents about what's happened and actually at the at the at the top of the the tree if you like you've got to establish who's going to be the person with whom uh, responsibility for leading or in the emergency services scenario commanding that response so it may well be for example that the head teacher is the leader of the response or the chief executive officer of in the multi-academy trust is the leader of the response however that doesn't necessarily mean always that that's got to be the case because you've also got somebody who is going to put things in place so it might well be that you determine that your leader of your or, or the commander or the head teacher actually doesn't do the role of, of being front and center and that they um, uh, delegate that to someone else then it's about the activation of the plan how do you activate the plan where where is the plan in the first place do you know where it is is it on a shelf is it you know in somebody's cupboard if it's locked in a safe then that's no use whatsoever it needs to be accessible Communication protocols, we'll have a little look about later, uh, about how we keep people informed. As a general rule, the estimation is that in times of crisis, the normal communication routes and communication protocols uh, go up by tenfold. So you've got to be prepared for that. And then it's about exercising your plans and making sure that those involved in putting the plans into place know what they're doing, how are they going to close the school? How are they going to communicate, etc.? 
And then at the end of it, it's to review and debrief and amend the plans to make sure that you learn the lessons from uh, um, other opportunities and from what's happened. So there's basically three phases to uh, crisis management. The first is the pre-crisis. So it's a response in recognizing that the crisis can happen. You've got to understand that we, we can all be subject to these things. It's about looking at the risk assessment and looking how you're going to mitigate the risks. And once you've identified the risk, what, do, what are we going to do about it? We may have to spend some money, we may have to retrain people, but we've got to plan, we've got to prepare, we've got to train, we've got to practice and make sure it's second nature to people. And then we've got to review and amend plans and then retrain and uh, etc. Communication plan, you might want to look at having a separate communications plan so that you know who to ring up. The bigger trusts often have somebody with, with media experience that they can call to come up and make sure that they uh, uh, address the media in a particular way. And at the end of the day, one of the main things around crisis management is planning to recover and return to normal at the earliest opportunity. Then if we're responding to the plan, the first thing that we always must remember is, first of all, we've got a plan, but then get the plan out. It's all right having the plan there, but if we, if we don't look to, to use the plan, then um, you know, what's the point of having the plan in the first place? And the idea is that it's a, it's a much quicker, a much better, a much, much stronger response. And then in relation to communication, communicate, communicate, communicate pity, praise and promise. If you watch the politicians on the TV, they're absolutely fantastic at saying things like uh, giving the message out on the media. We're really sorry for what happened. Um, uh, and, you know, we pass on our, we pass on our commiserations to people, etc, etc. Then they go on and say, weren't the teachers and staff and the people responding to the emergency absolutely wonderful? And then they promise about what's going to do. We're going to learn the lessons from what we've done and we'll make sure that in the future, everything that went wrong in this scenario will not go wrong in the next one. So it's about making sure that your communication messages are balanced and that they, they um, uh, are able to um, communicate properly when there's a pressure on from possibly the media. Um, look to appoint a spokesperson someone who has got a natural gift of talking to other people communicating very well very good communication skills and that can stand if needs be in front of a radio microphone or in front of a, a, a an audience and talk about what's happened talking about what what you've done um, uh, as a as a company or as a school deliver what it says in the plan. So if it says that you evacuate the school via the hall, then make sure you do it that way. Because actually that will then mean that people uh, within the emergency services can be given a copy of the plan and say, this is where we're taking children out if there's a fire. This is where if there's a gas leak, we're gonna do this course of action. And then mitigate the effects of the crisis. So what we're trying to do is, um, maximize safety and minimize risk and all those sorts of things and then uh, mitigate generally the effects of the crisis so that we can return to normality as quickly as possible which is the the, the goal for everyone i suppose and then phase three and if we look at the current uh, crisis that we've all got we've not got there yet um, we continue to um, uh, get guidance out of the department and out of the government um, none of which obviously is contradictory to anything that we that we say or do um, and then we continue to communicate we are still communicating with our with our staff our parents our pupils our communities um, we've got to look to the future what will normality look like post the crisis and down the left hand side there you can see again that we learn from reviewing the incident uh, review from the incident review the plan communicate keep the promises we made in phase two communication continues all the way through and one of the things that that the police learned from the Kanoko um, refinery disaster was that that what the company did they called them red coats 
and they put probably 60 or 70 percent of their employees into red coats and they went all around the villages saying hi we're from Kanoko. here's our insurance details if your windows have been uh, uh, have been taken out because of the explosion just contact these people and they'll pay for your replacement windows and what they did was reputationally they got a lot and a lot of the local people who could have caused them problems reputationally in the long term on their side what we the police learned from that was the fact that we had to get into communities with them at the immediate response stage to make sure that people understood what, what the police were there for. The water board do it very well in flooding these days, as do the environment agency. And then looking forward again, you know, we, we want to reassure ourselves that things will get better and that we work towards normality, however that may look, because I think normality in the future will change. So looking at it from a slightly change of tack now, COVID-19 and uh, um, what it brought to um, Delta Academies Trust and the way that we dealt with it. I'm looking at it here, not from a schools or an executive um, uh, route really. I'm looking at it from a chair's perspective. So the first question that I came up with um, in uh, March and it seems forever ago now and, and uh, when the, all of the things that everybody's been through. We were, they, they said, we're going to close the schools. Well, actually, what schools were closed? Because very quickly it was made self-evident or, or it was made aware to everybody that schools were becoming children's care centres as part of the national response to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. So we at Delta continued to talk about schools and academies for a little while until actually one of the things that we did early doors, we, we um, uh, deployed some of our executive principals into the local authority education meetings. And it became obvious that, that the local authorities who were leading the local authority response, class schools as being their buildings, being their uh, uh, opportunities, to use them as care centres for the vulnerable and key worker children. And then on March the 18th, as we, you will no doubt remember, um, uh, Mr Johnson went on to um, uh, television to announce to the country that, that um, although there was no immediate danger to pupils, staff or the school, we were, we were going to close the schools, I think it was on the following Monday. So at that point, we at Delta decided that that was going to be a crisis management response. We thought at, the, at first, until we started to pick through it, that it was unknown territory for everybody. Or actually, was it unknown territory? we would got in place as many as you, uh, 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 with uh, the same as many as you will have, well-practiced um, procedures and policies for closing individual schools. If your central heating goes off in the middle of winter and the children will freeze to death within the school, you know already what you're going to do. You're going to close the school, you're going to contact parents, you're going to tell the local authorities, you're going to tell the trust, etc, etc. So what we decided to do was that we would use all of that to our benefit and we would implement existing strategies for dealing with the initial closures. So we'd already got plans in place for doing that. We already had school comms, for example, uh, to make sure that we can contact parents in the event of an emergency. Um, we'd got in place um, the availability of, of, of staff to go out into the community. Some of our learning managers already go out into the, into the communities and deal with the community on a, on a regular basis. So we'd got things in place already. Um, we um, then started to look at uh, creating a, a, a bespoke response to having to close multi-site requirements. So we've got to close many, many sites. Um, and so what we, what we decided to do was that we uh, would look, and I'll go into this a bit later, around creating some hubs. We had to agree some communication strategies to make sure that our message was getting out to communities, to parents, to uh, 
uh, all of those stakeholders that we, that we access on a daily basis that needed to know what was going to happen. We wanted to also implement both a statutory and a volunteer response to the crisis. And by that, what I mean is that there was a requirement placed on us to look after vulnerable and key, pu key uh, children from key workers, and that's what we wanted to do. We also wanted to be engaged in a volunte voluntary response to helping out uh, for example, with the health service in provision of equipment. We got lots of equipment within, particularly with our secondary schools, within our chemistry labs, within our physics labs, that we could probably, you know, we'd got uh, disposable gloves and masks and goggles and things that we could probably pass on. So we decided that we wanted to uh, uh, help with the volunteer side of that as well. And then um, we had to design and implement some structures to mitigate the demands of the crisis. And um, what I've put now, I, I um, for my own purposes, really, um, and based on my previous experience, um, what I wanted to do was create my own strategy uh, about how we were going to deal with it, uh, deal with the response. And so that I always had a bit of a check back and something to relate to, to make sure that we were doing everything that we possibly could to uh, make sure that we were mitigating the, uh, mitigating the outbreak. So we wanted to work collaboratively uh, with others, with the local authority, with uh, other stakeholders, with other schools, to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 outbreak on all of our stakeholders. We wanted to maximise the safety of pupils and staff and parents and communities, lots of vulnerable people out there, as well as the vulnerable uh, pupils, and key worker pupils that we're still having to cater for. We wanted to minimise the risk to everybody. We wanted to deliver on the national requirement that was being placed upon us as schools and as care centres. We wanted to enable and empower trust leaders to respond effectively to existing and developing circumstances as they were presented before us and that we had um, the capability of having quick time response to lots and lots of different changing scenarios. We wanted to ensure that the Trust continued to deliver its statutory and regular, regulatory obligations in full. We still had to deal with the ESFA, the department, etc. And there were additional demands placed upon us on reporting processes and the like. So we wanted to make sure that we could deliver all of those things. I wanted to deliver and, and project an effective communication strategy. So how we were going to do that. We wanted to maintain financial rigor that's demanded of us all, even though in, in terms of crisis, we've got to make sure that we're getting value for money, et cetera. And I also wanted to uh, work towards getting back to normality at the earliest opportunity. That's not moving on, is it, is it just a sec? So if we look at phase one, which was, our, which was sort of our pre-crisis terms, we were getting lots of information coming out from the Department of Health and Public Health England uh, in relation to parents and communities, monitoring the progress of COVID-19 nationally and internationally. Um, we called a specific meeting of our risk and audit subcommittee just to go over uh, what, we were, what we were seeing starting to emerge. And our executive team um, uh, was starting to prepare for the anticipated closure that we knew would be coming. Um, and, and then I had a specific um, conversation with our trustees to try and um, uh, let them know at the earliest opportunity uh, what, we were, what we were planning to do. So then uh, post closure, we obviously set the strategy. We looked at the implications for pupils, parents and the workforce, communities, etc. We worked very, very closely with local authorities and the general education sector. So with, with other trusts, with the regional schools commissioner, we started sending out communications very early to the different stakeholders to make sure that, that we had told people what we were thinking. It was important to us to, for the communities to recognise that we were uh, making sure that um, uh, we were looking after their children and looking after, after their interests at heart. We used the existing plans that we discussed earlier to close the academies. We considered and went to actually a hub and spoke response. We created 
uh, uh, 30 hubs across the trust into which we put basically they were located in our secondary schools but we put primary schools into um, it, into those hubs along with the secondary schools and we also invited local authority schools that were out on the limb to come and join us as well and actually we had our own schools our own academies going into some of the local authority hubs as well one of the best things that we did and actually this morning at our board meeting we were looking through this we created a decision log and the decision log meant that every decision that was taken that would affect the response to covid uh, uh, was made in a properly considered way and the rationale for each of those decisions was written down because we we knew that at some point in the future we would be asked to account for those uh, decisions we immediately looked at succession planning nominations to ensure that the immediate continuity of business for the trust would go ahead if one of us became either infected or we had to isolate or in fact worse came to the worst and we lost somebody in the in the short to, to longer term so we made specific determinations in relation to the executive team and non-executive determinations about who could go then and make decisions uh, uh, for the future if any of us became incapacitated um, looking at the operational response um, this is our initial response the regularity uh, we wanted to make sure that regularity and statutory compliance um, uh, was um, prioritized we wanted to to authorize large financial purchases we did that I signed off uh, along with the CEO on a purchase of 484,000 pounds worth of free school meal vouchers on the first day of the crisis so it was about the decision making it was about making sure that we'd uh, safeguard requirements were delivered. We wanted to empower and support and streamline our trust and academy decision making. As a consequence of that, I as the chair sought a specific um, uh, approval or proposal out to the other trustees to get it on record that they were happy with the chair uh, becoming the decision maker on behalf of the board for immediate decisions that needed to be taken. Our local boards are called Academy Advisory Boards and we suspended those uh, on day one for the simple reason that we wanted to draw in the decision making to a very small group of people who could act very quickly and determine where things needed to go and what we needed to spend money on and how we could best uh, support our schools. Uh, we agreed a communication strategy we communicated with principals, chairs and communities. We engaged immediately with the trade unions to make sure they were they understood where we were coming from, what we were doing. And we made representations to the wider education sector, local authorities, regional school commissioners and others uh, in determining what we were gonna do as regards to a trust response. Anne, is there anything you want to come in? Yes, uh, Steve, thank you very much for that. I'll just pause for a moment to give uh, colleagues a chance to type any questions they may have in chat. Uh, welcome some colleagues who've arrived um, into, the, into the session quite recently. It's good to have you here. A couple of questions I have for you, Steve. How important was the decision uh, to, uh, for you to become the decision maker on behalf of the board and what impact did that have? Okay, so the idea of becoming the decision maker was in order that I could communicate directly with the chief executive officer, who is the accounting officer in our trust and also the chief um, financial officer. Um, because we were, because of our scale, we were having to authorise purchases, for example, for many thousands of pounds. Normally that would go through a process, through our financial processes um, that would uh, uh, certainly half a million pounds would go to the board of trustees for approval and um, basically we didn't have time for that which is why we uh, wanted to bring together the decision makers in 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 in, in one room effectively and uh, and an act but what we did to ensure that we were acting um, in accordance with the financial handbook is we actually got a proposal and we had that signed off by the other trustees. If anything else had happened uh, that needed full board um, uh, confirmation or approval, 
I was then uh, able to send out an email and we did it by email to make sure that people were all signed up to it. Great. And in terms of changing the authority for some of the senior leadership and executive team, yeah. did you do that through a change of scheme of delegation or was that through a, approval by the board and, and limited? It was, it, it was approval by the board limited to, to um, the effects and mitigations of COVID. Okay. Um, you, you touched on, on safeguarding there. I think it'd be interesting to know how, uh, given that you were becoming these community hubs and facilitating children from other schools, how did you ensure that your safeguarding procedures were robust and that you had all the information you needed about children from, from other institutions? When the primary schools went into the secondary, we deployed the primary uh, staff with them. So um, in effect, they, they were, they were um, a school within the secondary building on their own. So a lot, apart from the physical building itself, the remaining uh, safeguarding protections and things were, were as they normally would be. Um, despite the reduced numbers of staff, we made sure that we always had a, a, a designated safeguarding lead available. We also made sure that we got the right interactions with the local authorities from uh, education welfare perspectives and that the, the normal communication channels for safeguarding were open. And we just needed to make sure also that anybody going into the school um, that we didn't know were appropriately inducted on safeguarding procedures, etc. And that everybody was identifiable that went into those hubs. That's lovely. Thank you, Steve. We'll go back to the next part of the presentation. And again, for any colleagues who've joined us uh, recently, please do use the chat facility to uh, put any questions to Steve. Um, and anything unanswered, we will follow up after the session with a uh, frequently asked questions document. Thanks, Steve. Okay. So the, the next uh, phase really that, that I just wanted to look at was um, in relation to the initial operational response, really. What we did as, as a precursor to um, uh, the schools closing with a bit of um, foresight more than anything, was that we've got an awful lot of, of primary children. And so we, we, you can see the figures there. We, we um, uh, bought in, not created, we bought in um, nine and a half thousand primary revision packs. We bought in 3,700 revision books for key stage one and key stage two, which were purchased in advance. The executive principals attended the local authority meetings as a part of the collaborative response, which I mentioned here. There's free school meal vouchers are there. Um, uh, the creation of the hubs, I think I said 30, 30 hubs, it was 10 hubs of 30 schools, so I apologize for that. To care for the vulnerable and essential workers. Um, and and uh, we opened those to non-Delta schools. On an average uh, uh, day, we had across the trust about 170 pupils in um, and about 8% of the staff. We issued um, uh, loan laptops and tablets to those unable to access IT hardware. We uh, created uh, a student home classroom and we also uh, created um, an IT help desk, an internal IT help desk, so that if the kids who were at home couldn't access their normal school accounts, they had a telephone number to ring uh, where they could talk to an IT uh, tech person and get access onto there. So we were able to do that. Um, we supported communities. I mentioned earlier about what we got in the stores in relation to chem chemistry labs, etc. We had, um, uh, we produced 2,800 face visors that went to the local uh, um, NHS, 1,700 safety goggles, 7,300 pairs of safety gloves, and that was all donated to the local NHS centres. What we found was that it, it was a real coming together, a real sense of staff belonging to the trust, and it enhanced and continues to this day, actually, the buy-in the, the, to the, we, we try and have an ethos and culture of being um, a family of schools within one trust, 
And it really enhanced our, our ethos and culture and brought us together even more than, than previously was the case. We, we found that we got um, a great response because we allowed leaders to lead and, and we empowered people to make decisions on the spot. So there was a great, um, uh, a great feeling amongst our leaders that they were um, entrusted and included in the decision making for their, their own schools. Um, staff were entrusted to, to uh, move quickly and everybody was working at pace and everyone was trusted to react and produce positive solutions that, that to, to issues that came to us. And there was a real sense of communities, both internal and external communities, coming together uh, in response to, to the crisis. And um, that continues to this day in actual fact. And then we started looking uh, quite early doors on, uh, on day one, really, about what we were gonna do for um, the return, which we knew eventually would come. We weren't quite sure when it would come, but we knew it would come. So we started to, to um, uh, look at things like updating the primary reading, reading strategy, for example. We did some additional best book work specifically designed for, the, for return to school, which has continued. You know, we updated behaviour and safeguarding and, and, and any other additional policy updates were completed. We started to produce a specific COVID-19 recovery curriculum, which is benefited since from further updates as we're moving along. We used uh, a lot of the Thrive influences that we have within the trust in planning for the return of pupils. All staff received training. I mean, every member of staff received training that was updated for COVID-19. So that when the children went back into schools, every member of staff knew which door they were gonna use, where the hand sanitizers were. Um, where the bubbles were going to be placed etc and actually we we did a lot of preparations for teachers and staff teaching assistants caretakers cooks for the return to school and we delivered an awful lot of, of, of CPD uh, on the return to wider opening as well Um, for the wider reopening we we started then to look obviously I don't know a three weeks or four weeks ago at, at, at returning and the wider reopening. And so um, centrally we created um, a risk assessment process um, and um, that was created as a trust template and was given to all of our, our head teachers in relation to completion at the local level. So whether you've got a school there, we've got one, one particularly small school with 60 or 70 pupils in, whether you're in that sized um, setting or whether you're in a 2000 place secondary school, it was all done uh, at the local level. So we saved uh, by doing the central uh, risk assessment uh, template. It meant that we as trustees and the executive leaders were able to look at each um, uh, set of risks and mitigations that were brought about at the local level but we were looking at the same. So we were comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges from an oversight perspective, although it was all done locally. We had quite a lot of discussion as trustees about the indemnity of staff and the trust liability when people were going back to, into unknown territory in relation to returning to school and wider reopening. You know, for example, what happens if we've got an outbreak in one school or in a bubble or whatever? What are we going to do? What's the risk behind that? What's the risk we've got in relation to staff who are self-isolating? How do we get the staff in, etc.? We had a special trustee meeting to address the concerns of trustees and around delegations and authorities. So we did that uh, virtually. And what we did was we delegated um, the risk assessment oversight to our executive leaders. So the um, risk assessment itself was completed at the local level by the head. We're a big trust, so we have, uh, we have uh, executive principles. So the executive principal oversaw and was able to um, support the head teacher's um, 
uh, completion of the risk ass assessment process because we were concerned that if the heads were left alone to do that then what protection did they have in the work that they'd done so we wanted to make sure that everybody up the tree or down the tree was protected so the the head was protected and overseen by the executive head the uh, uh, the executive head was overseen by in our case the primary uh, the primary lead um, trust lead and also up the secondary chain the same and then the um, primary and secondary lead were overseen by the chief executive and protected by the chief executive and the chief executive was protected by the board ultimately so we just wanted to make sure that everything was done we uh, tried at length to get a further uh, idea of, of the development of the knowledge of the DfE guidance. We had questions and discussion on primacy, on safeguarding decisions uh, about whether it was the local authority who had primacy or the trust board. We had protections in place for the decision makers, as I say, and there was oversight of induction for teachers and staff in risk-based practice for returning the pupils. Uh, Anne, did you want to have a break there? Yeah, I've just got a few questions for you, Steve. Okay. Could you reflect on how useful PR companies have been or could be in a situation like this? Yeah, very much so. One of the one of the um, things that we actually had happen to us was that one of our care caretakers at one of our schools, uh, in uh, as the wider reopening was happening. Um, actually uh, had been in school and had felt really poorly and had gone home and so what we wanted to do um, as it turned out um, unfortunately the the caretaker had had a heart attack but this happened over a weekend and what we were well not what we were concerned with but what, it, what we wanted to make sure was that we'd got our communication strategy right around that Lots of parents would be um, would be concerned around whether or not the caretaker was were, was suffering from uh, COVID nineteen or or was it a heart attack? In actual fact, he was tested twice. He was tested uh, once on on the first day, and then he was tested again in hospital, uh, and he was found not to have uh, um, the COVID uh, um, virus. However, for a trust. We were, we were looking at what we were going to have to do because we would probably become the focus of attention nationally because we're a big trust. What happened, you know, did we make the right decisions? Did, was the risk assessment process right? And so what we did was we engaged with a PR company that we use on a regular basis to make sure that, that we um, uh, were able to put together a, a message that was both um, accurate in its factual accuracy but also about getting the message out that, that this is this was something that that we had envisaged it was part of our process and and uh, the risk assessments had been done so we engaged with a PR company to, to do that with us. Uh, supplementary question on that Steve do you have an agreed uh, policy on the use of PR companies? Uh, yeah, we do. We uh, um, as a as a we use it as a trust, not as an individual school. So so we we have um, an agreement with a PR company uh, that um, uh, who we often use if we have um, a, a message to get out. So it's not just about emergency response. It's something that we use on on a fairly regular basis as well. That's very helpful. Thank you. A couple of other questions. Um, you talked about uh, the recovery curriculum and the planning for that. How, how do you ensure with that recovery curriculum that you're not reducing the breadth and depth of the curriculum offer while ensuring that the gaps are closed? Right, well what, what, what we've done is uh, as, a, as, a, as a process is as we've gone along we've, we, we um, have used some of the work that that the children have produced and as of today um, we've got um, uh, some fantastic work done in primary specifically but we've got 85 percent of our primary vulnerable pupils in school as of this morning um, and so what we've been able to do and we've used it quite regularly is some of the work that they've been submitting the teachers have been marking and assessing and and feeding back to the pupils so that that 
there will be a restriction in the first instance, I think, with the recovery curriculum about uh, um, uh, fo uh, focusing really about getting the, the pupils back into school around English, math, science and, and reading, writing, science and maths in primary. Um, but that's that's limited to four weeks. We, we are employing people as one to one tutors so that the most vulnerable get as much help um, uh, to get back to normal as possible and to try and close the gap. We do have a pretty good record in relation to closing the gap for the disadvantaged pupils normally. And so we bring a lot of that with us um, uh, into the COVID response. And, it, uh, and one of the things that we've looked at particularly is about how we're going to reintroduce um, behaviours for learning, because lots of children for the last 16 weeks won't be used to learning in the formal way they'll have been doing it at home. So we're looking at all of those sorts of things. Really helpful, Steve. I'm conscious of time. There are other questions on yeah. the chat, which I'm going to pick up uh, further on the presentation where I know that we'll, we'll, we'll have a little bit more time. So Polly's, we will come back to those. Steve, if we could carry on with the presentation, that would be great, thank you. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so just moving on quickly then, um, From from my perspective, what these are some of the things that we've done, and then I'll uh, they're there to read actually rather than go through them. So we've done updates in reading strategies and review performance management processes, etc. But we had a trust board meeting this morning, so I was just going to try and bring you just up to date a little bit um, with what we're doing as of now. Um, and so what we've done is, is particularly around year six, year seven transition. Um, what we've done is, is we've, uh, our subject directors and specialist uh, teachers um, have created a booklet for year six pupils that they can complete over the summer, um, which will be part of the, the, the year seven assessment process when they come into school. But what we've done is we've introduced virtual tours of the academies, the secondary academies into which the pupils are going to go. Uh, uh, in in September and so uh, they are apart from the physical aspects of going into the new school they are getting a full and probably properly um, uh, inducted process of transition there's because the, we've used the secondary school some of our primaries feed into there so some of the children actually get have had the physical walk around the buildings as well but what we've managed to do as well is, is have some good conversations between the year seven teachers and the year six teachers about where the children are, what do they need to do when they come back to school? Um, how can year six teachers help out with year seven appreciation of where the kids actually are? And I think that's really important. Um, we've also had um, uh, apparently hidden away in the in the background of the DfE guidance was a requirement for year seven and year nine pupils to have been back into school for a face-to-face -face meeting for at least half an hour uh, in this current period um, we we've done that we've had them in um, we've had them in at different times coming into different bubbles so so every one of our year seven and every one of our year nine pupils has been seen the vast majority of year six pupils have, have either been seen, contacted, or had work presented by members of staff. So we've tried to mitigate the, the um, influences of COVID on both disadvantaged and non-disadvantaged as much, as much as possible. We've even done along the line with early years, for example, um, the early years um, uh, return curriculum has been looked at as part of um, the key stage one learning strategy so that everything everything follows through in that regard so so we've done what we consider all the you know what we can at the moment to, to make sure that pupils are not too disadvantaged um, these are another few uh, lists of, of what we continue to do um, all of our of our um, CEFs and academy development plans have been updated to reflect the current position. Uh, Off-call deadlines and assessment requirements have been looked at for next year. Um, uh, we've looked at whether we need to um, 
changed the length of the school day. As an academy trust, um, we can we can I'll say more or less we can we can change the length of the school day to accommodate what we need to do. Um, we've looked at summer provisions. We've looked at recovery of costs, local lockdowns. What's the effect going to be on pupils, parents, staff, and communities? Um, We've also had a look at daily and weekly revisits of the risk assessment to ensure that they're all still fit for purpose. Um, we continue to, to look at preparation based on, on updated guidance and ensure our decision making is still in line with our original strategy. So we keep referring back to our strategy. Is it in line with our ethos and culture and vision for the children that we're dealing with? And we're continuing to work at some point uh, on what will um, uh, be the return to normal. Um, this slide here is a little bit um, of a bit of a memory jog for us really. What do we foresee the future as? Um, as we, we've got to look backwards to reflect on what's happened. We've got to try and learn lessons from the crisis and I suppose one of the biggest lessons is about how to work virtually and how we can use the virtual environment to our advantage in the future for, for children. Um, we've got to develop new working practices to mitigate future crises. We've got to do that, you know, and, and, and certainly one of the things we're looking at at the moment is how we can realign our website so that we can use it more productively for um, uh, future proofing and, and using virtual conferencing, et cetera, for teaching. Um, we've got to seek reassurance um, uh, amongst ourselves for the, for, the, for the future demands that are going to be placed upon us. Um, we've got to continue to provide the level of service that's gone before, you know, deliver better systems and processes, demand more, sadly demand more of those already delivering above and beyond. So I'm talking about staff, basically. You know, we've got to try to distinguish what will be needed for the next time and endeavour to deliver more for less, consider what may be next and what needs to be done for September and beyond. Um, who knows where, where that will take us in time to come. Um, you know, and what's, this is just a, a, a thought provoking, hopefully, the future for the education sector. Um, those are the questions that we're starting to ask of ourselves now. Um, and I think that uh, um, those are the things that, that we as a sector, not necessarily as a trust, but as a sector, what will the role of schools be? You know, looking at the wider aspect of future cross-party working, future school, school and trust leaders, are they only going to be educationalists or are they going to be uh, um, from the different uh, sectors that we the, the skill set that that we and you all show you know in your governance uh, work all the time so there's just some bullet points there to to uh, a bit for thought provoking but what we must do is not forget to prefer, prepare for the next crisis course it will inevitably arrive and just to to finish off and i'm conscious of time i'm here but just to finish off how many of you saw um, or have been um, uh, able to look at this? On the 23rd of June on the DFE website, an example of the next crisis to hit schools in my, my humble opinion. Um, marauding terrorist attacks. And why do I say that? Because schools and offices and hospitals have been told to prefer, prepare for the next terrorist attack. So how on earth everybody is going to do that you know, how and when will you and your staff find the time to do this and as you continue to deal with COVID-19? And I think I'm there just about. Um, okay. Any questions from anybody? And over there to you, are, Anne. There are quite a few questions for you, Steve. So I'll start with the first one, which is about risk and uh, what you usually do to manage risk in terms of risk registers and processes. Okay, so, so risk registers and risk processes. We, we as a trust, um, look at all our policies, et cetera, as, as many of you will do, uh, in relation to risk management and not just in relation to the daily operational stuff, but also around reputational risk and uh, risk involved with the wider sector of multi-academy trusts. 
We have a risk and audit committee who meet half termly and they, they go through all the different risks that are highlighted. In relation to things like school trips, we, we um, uh, have a look at those on a regular basis and we have um, an IT system that we use for um, uh, looking at the risk in relation to things like school trips. Um, all of our building work, so, so testing, for example, of the electricity systems, gas systems, telephony systems, that's all part of the risk process and that's all organised from the centre. Um, uh, the local risk is obviously looked at by the school and our AABs, our Academy Advisory Boards, local boards, um, one of their um, uh, scrutiny areas, because we give them delegated authority uh, and powers, to look at um, uh, scrutiny areas is around health and safety and uh, safeguarding SEND uh, and various other aspects of that. So it's looked at across the trust and it's also looked at locally. Lovely. Got a very specific question here about, do you operate sports centre within your trust? And if so, have you managed uh, uh, during the crisis, have you managed them as part of the overall trust or separately? Uh, no, we, we don't have sports centres in our, in our um, uh, trust. However, what we do do is we have, particularly the secondary schools have got some gyms that are, that are um, used by the school during the day, but actually in the evening they're used for community purposes. And so what we've done is we've taken, taken those into, um, uh, into context. So we've closed down the out of hours use effectively. Um, and then when we go to the wider reopening, then what will happen is that they'll be risk assessed on the same basis as the schools are being risk assessed. Um, in terms of your capacity and, and your ability to do school to school support during COVID, are there elements of that that a smaller trust could learn from and replicate? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the school to school support that, that we've put in place as a big trust, actually, I'm working with a, with a trust currently of, of, of five schools down in, in um, Leicestershire. Uh, but what they've done is, is they've um, uh, created, uh, a bit like we did, they created their own, their own hub where I think they created two hubs, but they've included in those hubs local authority schools. And so the, the, the um, risk assessment process and, and the safeguarding processes, behaviour uh, processes that have been used by us on a bigger scale within our own trust, they've used across local authority schools. So they've been out there and have been really well um, received in going out and making sure that they're giving some support to the system as well as to their own trust. And that's been really well received. And, and also we've engaged at, um, at, at Delta with local authorities to make sure that, that everybody learns from everybody else. And we, we've, all of the things that, that we've spoken about this evening have been in, uh, made available to, uh, uh, to other trusts, either through Facebook or through um, kind of Confederation Schools Trust or, or many different avenues to make sure that people access all the things that we've got. You mentioned uh, the guidance and analysing the guidance, Steve, and there was a lot of guidance. There needed to be a lot of guidance coming through. How was that coordinated by your trust? Was, was that the role of the clerk or was that very much you monitoring all of the guidance to make sure nothing was missed? Um, well, we did it, we, we, we did it in, in a, a number of ways, actually. We, uh, we're fortunate enough that we employ a compliance officer who is, who is also the company secretary. So, so um, uh, that particular um, uh, lady, along with a couple of other ladies, were actually given the role of going through all the guidance. But equally then, we hived off the primary guidance to our primary team and hived off the secondary guidance to the secondary team. And so we were coming at it from two or three different ways. And I've got to say that the, the work that... that um, CST have done in relation to providing a daily update around the guidance has been extraordinary and, and actually that's really helped us and I think it will have been a great benefit to some of the smaller trusts who don't have the capacity that we have to, to read through and sift all of that guidance. 
Um, one of the points you made earlier about preparation for and your very inclusive preparation for all of the staff have been considered coming back, including support, catering, everybody involved with the school. Yeah. Um, what what uh, provision are you making or anticipating in terms of increasing counselling and bereavement services for, for staff and, and pupils? Um, this is something that we've worked on, um, not only ourselves, but, but also um, making sure that the trade unions are on board with. We, we have our own HR provision within the trust, um, but many of the small trusts actually um, uh, have their own HR provision through somebody that they might bring under contract to the trust or, or even within, you know, the SATs, for example, may, may do that across and work with some local authority HR support. But what we've been trying to do and what we, we've, it, is make available uh, through our HR systems the ability for, for people who are not feeling well or can't cope with the stress of coming back to school because it's a, a huge change. Some of them have actually you know, been shielding now for two or three months. Um, and so we're giving people an opportunity to come back into school gently and gradually and uh, making available for professional um, help, not just for staff, I've got to say. It's also there for pupils and their families if they need it. Uh, and making a provision available to them to make sure that they are um, uh, brought back into the world of, of education um, in an appropriate way and that they're given all the necessary support that, that they need. We're, we're absolutely aware of um, the general um, escalation of domestic violence, I think, that the country's seen across the piece. There's lots and lots of vulnerable children and vulnerable fam families out there who will need our guidance and support. And often the only safe place for them is in school. And so we need to make sure that all our provision is, is, is appropriate and caters for their needs. Thank you. Um, just not really wanting you to expand on this at the moment, because I think this would be a, a session in its own right. But one of our colleagues who has worked internationally um, just emphasised the importance of your last point, Steve, about the... Um, uh, terrorist attack and, and developing guidance. From what you've said today, uh, both in the first half of the session, which is very much the management of crisis and risk, and then the school's specific development of a response to COVID, uh, what could people take away in, in thinking about possible future crisis and, and how they could prepare? I, I think it, um, um... I think a lot of it is, a, is about recognizing the risks that are there. And also it's not necessarily about reinventing the wheel. It's using what you've got already that can be amended, can be adopted, can be uh, brought into uh, the crisis scenario or the emergency scenario that, you've all, that, that already exists and what people already understand are, uh, and, and have been uh, trained with for a, uh, yeah, trained in received CPD in. I mean if you take safeguarding as an example you know if you take safeguarding every school and every academy hopefully will have in place their own safeguarding procedures and um, you know and and actually who knows where some you know where a member of staff identifies an issue in relation to a, an individual or a number of children that could develop into a crisis because if you've got 10 children who are all being subject to um, uh, the possibility of grooming, that doesn't just relate to one child, it relates to 10 children, 10 families, 10 communities. And, and actually, you know, you've all got already um, uh, responses to those things. And actually it's about making them scalable. So if it's one child, you, you don't need to do it at scale. But actually, if it's 10 children, you might have to. So how do you scale up that response? It's about planning, it's about training, it's preparation, etc. So it's about making things that you've got already work for yourself in a crisis. Another one here, Steve. Um, you've, you've set out very clearly the, the thought and um, systems and processes you've put in place for, for staff returning, for supporting your community. How, how would you manage those staff who are still unwilling to return, even with the, the support in place, given the perception of risk? 
Okay, um, it is actually something that we that we've considered. Um, I think what what would happen is, is as I've outlined, they they would get support and uh, and and be included in 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 the debate, the discussions about them, the individual, and our HR team, are, uh, you know, often will do that. And, and continue to do that, and we'll do it specifically around um, the risk that people perceive. If somebody is shown to have a genuine um, uh, fear, or, or if they've got genuine health concerns that that they shouldn't be back in school, then you know, let's talk about it. Let's talk about. Um, uh, if they are under the doctor, for example, you know, let's get let, let's get the doctor's views on things and all. It's about that supportive message going out there. But ultimately, um, you know, they are employed as a teacher and we can put all sorts of different things in place. But if it's a blank refusal, I am not under any circumstances coming back to school. Um, uh, and if we've worked through all of the different things and support mechanisms that we have, then obviously that's another matter that we that we would have to look at and and we would have to look at that possibly at the ultimate under a capability type of, of thing or refusing to work or whatever that might be but that's got to be as a very very last resort and we are appreciative appreciative of, of people's um, uh, concerns of, of risk and how it how it may impact on them but I suppose ultimately there is a sanction there if it needs to be used and it would be regrettable on everybody's part if it ever got to that stage really. Yeah. Um, I did have a question earlier in the session which I thought I'd keep until now because it, it seemed to fit better with the flow. You mentioned lessons learned and review of, of, of what's happened so far. A uh, question from the floor, is there anything you would have done differently than you have done in the last few months? Um, Yeah, I think I think there is. I, I think we could have been better prepared. We were quite well prepared as it was, but I think we we you know we we as a nation have seen this um, evil COVID nineteen um, uh, virus spread its way across the world, really. Uh, and although we were quite um, early in recognizing that it may well have an impact. We, we, we started to look in at things. I mentioned earlier that we bought the revision packs uh, in advance of closure. Um, you know, we started buying those or looking at those in February. We could have perhaps looked at it earlier um, and, and put some mitigations in place there. We, we could have had, um, we could have had our own crisis management plan for COVID already in place um, but it's so so infrequent that we get something like that was it realistic for us to do that theoretically of course it was we should have done um, and and but I think the things that that we that we have learned from it um, is around the virtual environment I don't think that we appreciated that the virtual environment would become as effective and as necessary as it currently is and where it's going to be in the future um, we um, from a trust perspective um, we one of the best things we did was that decision log that I referred to and I think what we need to do in future is not necessarily with crises but as a matter of investigation, things are recorded in an investigation, for example, but have we a decision log within investigation? Uh, perhaps we don't, um, and perhaps we need to in the future. Um, how do we communicate? We've used every sort of social media that we could think of, you know, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever it might be, um, uh, YouTube, etc. We've done that. We need to make a, a, a a bigger effort around that. We need to have better CPD for staff in the management of dealing with uh, crises from an educational perspective. Um, that's not that they haven't coped with that, but we've we've done it on the hoof and we've learned how to deal with it. And so perhaps in the future we would use our learning from this to to better inform the way that we 
uh, deal with those issues uh, in the future. And also um, communication is always an issue. You know, we think that we've done okay with communication, but communication can always be better. And at the end of the day, one of the things that, that I took away from my career uh, actually isn't about what you do um, at the time of a crisis or during a crisis uh, or after a crisis. It's about communication, 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 communication. And if we communicate properly, then a lot of the mitigations that you have to put in place can be answered in your communication. Um, lastly, and linked to that, if you were to, if the audience here today were to take away three actions um, that they could complete to put them in a better position to manage future crises, what would you say those three things are? Um, improve your communication strategy, if in fact you have a communication strategy. Um, identify the roles that, that, that you would consider based on your risk assessment are the um, uh, most defining in your response. So it might be your head teacher, it might be your uh, SENCO, it might be your chief executive, or it might be your, you know, your compliance officer. Identify the roles that, are, that will define the way that you respond to a crisis and make sure that you have succession in planning uh, succession planning in place for making sure that those people who currently may be irreplaceable can be replaced and that you would continue to um, uh, function if they weren't there. So make it about the role as opposed to the person, make it role specific as opposed to person specific or individual specific. And the third thing I would say is um, look at your plans and make sure that you are able in the fullness of time to learn from what's happened over the last four months, five months, six months, and what continues to be happening in the future, and make sure you learn from that, and make sure that the next time something like this comes along, you, you're better prepared and in a better position to deal with it. Um, you know, we're lucky, we've got the size and scale to be, able, to be able to do that, but who would have thought that, you know, you needed your school business manager to get on uh, the free school meal site at, at one o'clock in the morning because they couldn't get on during the day. You know, make sure that those sorts of, of plans are in place and the, that um, you have a mitigation or a way to deal with them in the future. Great. Steve, thank you very much. And, and thank you to everybody who's joined the webinar this afternoon and, and sent in questions. Um, I think that, that wraps it up for this afternoon. As you're leaving uh, the session, you may want to just put any further questions. I'll just hand over to Hannah to, to uh, close off the session today. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks both um, very much. I really do hope that was helpful for everyone. Um, we will be making the slides um, available. Um, and if you do have any um, kind of further questions or food for thought after this session, um, please do just uh, email events at, um, and we'll be happy to pass those on. Um, we'll also be sending out a um, quick survey. Um, so I do ask you to please um, complete that if, just to let us know sort of how helpful we found the session and it will help us make sure that our events in the future um, are as helpful as they can be. But um, yeah, just again to reiterate a huge thank you to our speakers and to all attendees and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening and um, have a wonderful summer break. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.